G'day and welcome everyone to this special WPA Adobe event. This event is linked to our Kimberley May 2021 tours. Now, as some of you would know, especially if you're on the trip, someone special couldn't join us. Uh, we had fantastic time, stunning images. Sorry, the special person. I know that you wanted to be there, um, but uh, I'm going to give you a little tip at the end about how you can actually meet Julianne in the future. Without further ado, I just mentioned her name. Welcome, Julianne Costs from Adobe. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's so good to be here. I'm sorry that I wasn't there. You're right. That was that was not that was missing. That was was bad. But maybe someday. All right. So let's go ahead. I'm just going to get started. I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. And here we go. So today we're going to talk about what's new in Lightroom Classic. I'm going to start um, here in the library. I just want to show you a few quick things as far as the metadata panel and some other new features, but we're going to spend the majority of our time in the actual develop module, especially looking at all of those new masking features because there's some really cool stuff there. All right, so the first thing in the metadata panel right over here in the library, I just want to show you that there's a default right here. So this just shows you kind of the default settings, but it got a lot shorter. And so I've had a lot of people ask me like, ah, what happened to all those options? Well, you'll notice there's also a new button down here called customize. So as soon as I click on that customize, we can see all of the different options that you have that you can actually customize in that panel. So as much or as little as you want to see, all you need to do is say, hey, if you want to see it, just check it on. You might want to see the file size, the file extension, whatever it is, camera information. There's so much here. And you can also arrange it. So you can make a custom arrangement by just clicking on arrange. Now you can use these little grabber handles and you can just drag and drop them into whatever order you want. And when you click save, you'll notice that it's been updated and those new fields have been added. So that's great. Another thing you might have noticed is there's this target photo and selected photos. Right now, they're not highlighted because I only have one image selected. But as soon as I select multiple images, now we have the option to see the data for just the targeted photo or for all of the selected photos. Most of the time when you do selected photos, though, it's all just going to be mixed because they'll have different values. But that's not always true. So the one thing to know here that I want to point out is with the target photo, you know how Lightroom Classic has kind of this most selected, right? So all of these images up here are selected, but this one's the most selected because it's got the highlight around it. And if I click on another image, that becomes the most selected and so on. So you can quickly see just the information for that most selected now. All right, the other thing in the metadata panel, there's this new eye icon right up here. And if we click that on, what it's doing is it's going into what's called edit only mode. And I just kind of, I want to point it out because it's really quite clever. It's great, but it can also kind of hurt you because in edit only mode, you'll notice that all of the settings, like the capture date, the, the values that can't be changed, they're automatically hidden. And then the values that you can change, you can now see. But Lightroom Classic does not autofill, for example, the caption or the file name or the title or the copyright or the keywords, things like that. So what I'm just saying is if you went in and you added, say, a caption for each one of these images, and then you selected multiple images in edit only mode, you're not going to see the caption. So if you just start typing in, you could actually lose some data. So just be aware that that's how it works. And that is actually a feature, right? Because if I wanted to give all of these three stars, I could just click on three stars. If I want to give them two stars, they'll just get two stars. Oh, I'm only doing the target photo. <laughs> See, it's always good. Everybody makes mistakes. So what's happening is I'm only using the, the, or I'm only targeting the single photo. So that's why only this image changed. If I go to selected photos, now everything will change. It warns me, but I can say, don't show me that again. And now if I give them say one star, they'll all change two stars and three stars. Okay, so play around with the new features in the metadata panel when you have time. There are also some new metadata filters. And there are two of them. One is for day and one is for month. So in previous versions, you could always come up here to the metadata filters and then you could choose the, the date, right? But you couldn't just say, hey, you know what? Every May, 
I photograph a certain event. So I want to filter by month and I just want to go to May or whatever that is. So now not only can you go to the specific month, but you can also go to the specific day. So check those out under the metadata filters. All right. The last thing I want to talk about before we go over to the develop module is just super resolution. So that's a new feature. And um, what it does is it gives you two times the pixel count on the width and the height. So you actually get four times the pixel count in the entire image. And it's really great, not only for images that maybe you shot like 10 years ago on a lower res camera, but also if you had to like crop into an image and you wanna resize it and print it large. And, and that's the other reason is of course, when, when you are printing and you need that larger file size. So you do wanna start with the best quality image. So it's like everything in, in photography, it's garbage in, garbage out. But I do wanna find an image to run this on. So I thought I would also point out, you know, we have the folder area here and then we also have our collections area. A lot of people don't realize that you can search based on your collections. So if I knew, for example, that I was looking for super resolution and I knew that I had a collection called super, I could just type that in. And now I don't have to hunt through all of my different collections. And of course, the same thing goes for your folders. So you can quickly type in the name of your folder in order to go to that folder. So here we are with super. I'll go ahead and select that. And oh, it looks like I've already practiced this once. So let me grab this image and I'm just gonna delete it really quickly. This is the image that I want to run enhance on or super resolution. So right now we can see, I can click and zoom in, but um, let's look at the, yeah, it's only a, almost a three by 4.3K file. So I wanna make it you know, twice as large. So underneath the photo menu, I'll go ahead and choose enhance. Right now, when you are working with super resolution, and th this is just sticky, so it came up with whatever I set last time, but you don't have to do super resolution. If I uncheck this, there is another feature called raw details, um, and that can help improve the details in an image, right? Especially um, with the artifacts. Well, it says it right there reduces artifacts in most raw files without resampling it up. All right, but if you want to resample it up, then you've got to go to super resolution. But I'll just show you with this, the raw details, if I click and hold, that'll be before or without the enhancement. And when I release, it'll, it'll show me the enhancement. It might be really hard to see, especially if this image is compressed. But basically, if you look at the edges, especially edges around um, curves, you'll notice there's an improvement with raw details. When I go to super resolution, we will definitely be able to see this. So now, if I press and hold, you can see that's what that's what previous versions of Lightroom Classic would have created if you had just tried to double the resolution. When I release my cursor, now we can see that it's not just making up like data by interpolating it, but it's also looking at things like edges and filling them in so they're much smoother. It'll also tell you how long it's gonna take to do it and create the stack. And I don't expect you'll do super, you won't run this super resolution on every single image, but when you do need to resample something up, it works really, really well. So when I click on enhance, just to show you, um, it's actually gonna make a new file. So it's up to you, it's a raw file, completely non-destructive. So you can spend time and actually make edits to the original image and all of those edits are carried over. And what I mean by that is if we go to the original here, you can see that I'd already made some edits in the tone area in the develop module and all of those edits were carried over um, to the new you know, enhanced image. But what you might want to be careful of, I, I would, I'm not sure if you'd be careful of it, but what you'd probably want to do, and let's make sure I'm zooming into 100%, is you'd probably want to come into a few different features. So for example, um, in the detail panel, you might wanna take a look at sharpening and noise reduction after you've enhanced it because the resolution has changed and you might want to increase or decrease those values. And likewise, in the basic panel, things like texture and clarity, you might also want to make changes to those. Um, if you do want to do a, a number of images, if we go back to grid view um, and you have like, you know, 20 images you wanna run it on, you can select all of the images and then either choose photo and then enhance. It'll only show you the first image, but you can you know, run it in a batch like that. 
And this little shortcut, it's a little weird on Mac, right? So this little icon right here is actually for the control key. So it'd be control option I. And if you add the shift to that, so it'd be control option shift I, it'll run it. We call it headless. It just means that it would run the enhance command with whatever settings it already had set on all of your selected images. So it's a great way to do that batch processing. Um, so, one other, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Joanne, I was, I was just yeah. gonna say, I, I just finished a book recently and um, exactly what you said, there was, um, I've got images from an old Nikon D1X camera. So that's nearly 20 years ago and they're 5.3 megapixel files. And to use the enhance mode was, you know, outstanding. It was a really cool feature. Isn't that amazing? Like, I think it's pretty fascinating, especially over the past two years, because I've spent so much time in this little room, um, looking at older images and then using the new technology on those images makes yep. quite a difference. So some of those images that I was really thinking, you know, after they had their five-year lifespan and everything got so much better as far as capture, I thought, these just, they don't cut it anymore. And then all of a sudden with the new processing and now this new enhance, I can kind of resuscitate some of those images. It's Absolutely. Really nice. Yeah, I agree yeah. 100%. Yeah. Now you can't apply, um, you can't apply enhance twice on the same file. I mean, you could go back to your original and run it again and again, but you'd get a new file every time. So you can't, once you've enhanced it and it's twice as big, you can't then run it again, but you could always like export it at a larger size or you could open it in Photoshop and resize it, whatever you want. And also I think if you had a really large panorama, the maximum pixel count in Lightroom Classic is 65,000 pixels. So there might be times when people get in trouble because they can't, it just won't do it because we we have that limitation on on file size, so. Okay, I think we're ready for the develop module, don't you? Yep. I much prefer the develop module, so let's go in there. So I have a ton of images that I can use to show you these. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with this one. I'll tap the D key to go to the develop module and just click once to zoom out. I'm fitting in window. I usually go between fit and window and 100% when I zoom. So this image, um, well, let's just start with masking. I mean, I would, I would go through and maybe I should just walk through that. So my basic workflow, I mean, this was the original image and I know you're gonna be saying like, why didn't you just scoot over, stand in front of the window? And that way it wouldn't have that distortion. But the thing is, you, one, I couldn't cause I couldn't get over any further. And two, then the chair is not in the same spot, right? So sometimes you just have to correct the perspective after the fact. But the first thing that I always do is I always go in and I correct any lens distortions. And that's as easy as coming down here going to lens correction and just enabling these two options. So removing the chromatic aberration gets rid of that misaligned pixels and then the profile corrections help for any distortion by the lens. So I would do that first and then I would transform it. So I would straighten any perspective if needed. And we do that just by going here under transform. And what I'm doing here is I'm just using snapshots for each one of these steps just to make it a little bit easier so I don't have to sit here and, and tweak every single step. But if we look here, and I grab my tool under the transform panel, I've chosen the guided option because I want control. And then I just drew out these four guides using the lines in the image in order to correct that perspective. And when I was finished with that, then I went ahead and cropped it. So that would be my next step. I tend to crop early on my workflow, even if, even if I'm gonna change the crop later, just because if I do anything with the basic panel, and I do anything automated. So if I click like the auto button and I know we've told you for years, like don't touch the auto button, you can do better. But we've trained it with all of this, like this new um, Adobe Sensei, which is machine learning and, and, um, and uh, artificial intelligence. And it's gotten really quite good, but it does the auto on the cropped area. So if you know you're gonna crop it, go ahead and crop it first. So um, I would crop it then I would apply the profile that I wanted, right? So in this case, I shoot primarily landscape. So I would, uh, I would adhere or, or assign or apply the Adobe landscape profile. Now, there is a way very easily that if you do something to like all your images, not just, a, not just like a little, like a few images, but to all your images, like if you want to always apply the lens correction and you always want to apply the profile, you can do something 
called Setting Your Raw Default Settings. I'm not going to go over it right now because it would take too long, but I did bring up through um, my blog. So my blog is just jcost.com slash blog. And if you just Google like how, or go on my blog and search for how to customize Lightroom Classics default raw develop settings, you could probably just do Lightroom Classic default raw. It will come up with instructions that tell you exactly how to do that and why you would want to do that. So I just wanted you to feel comfortable that they are actually there. So for now, I'll, for today, I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna check those buttons, but it does help. And I, I'm all about getting rid of repetitive tasks and doing more creative things, but all right. Then there's spot healing. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, I do my spot healing last. So um, you can, but sometimes it's quicker to actually do it up front. In fact, even before you crop and transform. And the reason I say that is because once you've cropped, if you have something on the side of your image that you need to heal, it's sometimes it's hard for Lightroom to get the good data if it's beyond the area that you cropped. Also, if you know, like if you have a ton of things that you need to heal, you might wanna do it before you apply the lens corrections. Because if you think about it, what the lens correction does is it's actually creating like a mesh over your image and straightening your image, which means then that every time you tap with that spot, Lightroom has to figure out, okay, well, I'm gonna make a round circle, but the round circle really isn't a round circle. It's an oval because you've applied lens correction and I have to reverse and engineer all of that. So if you knew you had like, you know, 50 dust spots, I would do that before you even apply your lens correction. And then of course, you know that you can always copy and you can say, no, 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 just copy the spot removal. And then you could move to another image. So if they were really dust spots, you might wanna do this. If they're dust spots though, one caveat is you might want to go to the image where you've shot at like F2, right? Because those are gonna be bigger dust spots than if you've shot at F22. So you'd probably wanna make your spot healing the biggest size you can and then sync that to all of your images. Because if you did all the small ones when you got to the ones that you know you had F4 or whatever, they're gonna be bigger spots and it's probably not gonna do a good job because the original spots wouldn't have been big enough. Okay, so then after I do my healing, you can do your white balance, you can do a little auto toning, you can refine your tone. So a lot of times, you know, I might take my highlights all the way down and my shadows all the way up. If it's not enough, don't forget you've got curves, right? Super powerful. You can go in here for each individual curve, right? Red, green, and blue if you want to change color, or you can do the composite if you want to change tonality. And then after that, um, I would apply my presence. And a lot of times when I'm changing my shadows and highlights, I actually push them a little bit further than I think I'm going to need them. So my image will look a little bit flat because I know that when I add texture and clarity, it's going to boost up the contrast a little bit, either in the really fine details if I'm applying the texture or in kind of those, that next step of, you know, it finds an edge, but it's not the smallest, highest frequency edge. It's kind of the next larger edge. And it, because the clarity is gonna add a little bit more of the amount, right? That's the slider value, either increase or decrease it. It's gonna add that contrast on each side of the edge in a wider radius than something like texture. So sometimes I just make it a little flat knowing that I'm going to increase that texture clarity as well as dehaze. In fact, sometimes you can, um, you'll notice like I didn't set my black point in this image, I actually use dehaze to set my black point because a lot of times if I'm out photographing and I want to, if I have kind of a flat image and I need to extend the darker regions all the way down to get a better black point, if you use dehaze, you will also get a little bit of saturation. So it's just completely an aesthetic choice, but just thought that that might be something you might want to try. All right, so then I went into HSL I don't remember honestly what I did on this image. Okay, so I took the blue down and luminance a little to darken it and took blues and purples, increased their saturation a little bit. All right, so now at this point I would be done. It does say color grading um, with curves, but I didn't do anything significant. So at this point I would go into the new masking panel. Now the first thing that people were really like sensitive about is like, I just wanna tap one key and get my, my tool. I don't wanna to have to come over here and tap masks. Well, first you can tap M and that would get you the mask, 
But look, you can just go straight to whatever tool you want. So if you want the brush, you can just tap K and it will just give you the brush. So we have two new tools, right? We have Select Subject and Select Sky. Those are both machine learning um, and artificial intelligence. Then we have all the tools you already knew, the brush, the linear gradient, and the radial gradient. And then we've elevated all of the range masking. So it used to be that you would have to say, use a brush or the linear or radial gradient, and then use the color range on that painted or selected masked area. Now they're completely independent one of one another and they're much more powerful. So I'm just gonna tap K, that will give me the brush tool. As soon as I do that, I get the new masks panel, right? So we can move this around. That was the other thing people didn't want it like, ah, it's on top of my image. So you can reposition it. You can also make it smaller. You can go to compact view by clicking those double arrows right there. And you can also dock it right here in your panel. So if you have a large monitor, this is, this is fabulous because, well, I don't have a large monitor. I mean, I could hide some things here and get a little bit more space, but you'll notice that I can't always see all of the different options here when I do have it docked. So I'll go ahead and take that out for now. One thing you also might notice is down here, there's an option to reset sliders automatically. Again, a lot of people weren't finding that because um, they didn't have enough area there to show everything and they couldn't figure out why every time they added a new mask, it was going to give them, um, it was gonna reset the sliders. So that's, if you don't want it, obviously you can toggle it off. I'm gonna leave it on for now. And then one other thing, I think the disclosure triangle here for the brush is closed by default and so, they thought we took away the options for the feather and the flow and the density. They're there, you just have to use that little white triangle. Okay, so um, I'm just going to paint around the window here. I wanna make it a little bit more green. And I, I'm using, I, I have a scroll on my mouse so I can just make this bigger or smaller. So I'm making it smaller, but if I wanna constrain it to a straight line, all I need to do is hold down the shift key. However, Let's look at my settings. So my size is okay, my feather, that's the softness of the edge, right? I want kind of a soft edge there. The flow, I'm gonna do this in one fell swoop. In a minute, we'll talk a little bit more about flow, but for right now, I'm just gonna click and drag. And as soon as I start painting, you will see we're getting that red overlay. And I can get a little bit bigger of a brush there if I need to, or a little smaller of a brush. Not to worry, okay. So let's say I like that. We've got our red overlay. I can toggle this on or off by, by either clicking on this or tapping the O key. If you've got something red in your image, you can click on the color swatch and pick a different color if you want to. Let's leave it red for now. And what else can we do? Well, as soon as we start making our changes, that's going to hide that overlay. So let's say, for example, I wanna take the exposure down and I wanna make it a little bit more green, or maybe I wanna change the hue or something. We can go ahead and do all of those things. Of course, double clicking on any slider, will go ahead and reset that. Now, if I still wanna see the overlay, just tap the O key, it will come back. There's a lot of different types of overlays. So let me do this. Let me get a little bit larger of a brush, but let me decrease the flow. Because let's say I wanna darken down this area here, like that's kind of a green area, that little, like I don't know what it is, like a little drawer right there. And then there's some green around the window. So let's just enhance that. And let's say we like that. Okay, so by decreasing the flow, I was actually able to paint over the area multiple times and slowly build up the adjustment, unlike the window where I was painting at 100% and it just built it up as much as it could with a single stroke. If we wanna look at that, if you're used to Photoshop and you think, well, I think of, blast, of masks in black and white, we can come here and say, well, what is it gonna look like with white on black? and then show the overlay and you can see it looks much more like a Photoshop mask. So for some of you, I think that might be easier. But do you see also here now I'm noticing like, uh, I think I'm over spraying a little bit. So let's go back to the color overlay. Let's toggle off the mask. And if you had painted, and let's just make it like really obvious, I'll move my flow way back up. And let's say I painted over here and it was like, ah, oh, I really don't want that. So the brush has an eraser. And I'm pointing this out because a little bit later, I'm gonna show you how to add and subtract from masks. But if you're just using the brush, just come over to the panel and say, I want to use an eraser instead of a brush. And then we can come in here and we can just erase that. 
right? We can get a little bit larger of a brush. We can go in here again, check with white on black, tap O, make sure you got rid of it all. Okay, that should be fine. Put it back to color if you want to. Okay, so with the brush, you can always just use the eraser and go back and forth between them. All right, keep that in mind. Let's look at the mask panel. Here is my mask, here is the brush. You might be thinking, this is way too complicated. Why are there two elements? Ah, because a mask can be made up of multiple components. So right now I've only used a brush. If I hover my cursor on top, we see the red overlay. Same for both masks because this mask is only made up of one component. All right, let me double click on mask. I'm gonna call this window and it's really nice. You can rename them, right? So you can keep them all straight, that's lovely. And now let's create a second mask. All right. What kind of mask? How about a linear gradient? We should be familiar with that. Look at that, it reset all my sliders automatically. I'm gonna come up from the bottom, holding down the shift key will constrain it, right? To either a vertical or horizontal. There's a new little icon right down here so I can grab it in order to rotate it. You can always use command Z if you want to undo that. You can always change the width of the gradient or the height of the gradient. You can also just click on the bar if you want to rotate it that way. And this little pin will allow you to reposition it. So I'm just gonna do a real quick, let's just decrease the saturation there, maybe scoot it over and to warm it up a little bit and just take down the exposure. It might need a little pink in there too. I see there's a little pink in there. Okay, so again, um, kind of basic. If you were used to that tool, works pretty much exactly the same. So now let's get a little bit more complicated. Let's create a mask. I'll go to the radial gradient. Now I want to, let's say, just add a touch of light inside of the window, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and drag out my gradient and let's drag it a little bit too large, right? So you guys know we can, we can rotate it, we can resize it here, we can reposition it, right? And let's go ahead and just bring up the exposure, all right? So I'm, I'm shining a little bit of light, but unfortunately what it looks like is I'm outside the window shining the light. I want the light to be coming from inside the window, which means the light would not be on this bar across the window, right? It would be on the other side of it. So it also wouldn't be overspraying over here, right? So what we can do now with mask two, let's go ahead and call this um, light in room. Oops, yep, there we go. And this one was just the, um, I don't know, what do we call that? Uh, window sill, okay. All right, so the light in the room, when we click on that, it's made up of the radial gradient. You'll notice there's an add and subtract. So if I wanted to add to this, we click add. You can add as many components as you want, but what I wanna do is I wanna subtract. I wanna subtract this little bar going across the, the window divider. So I'm gonna click subtract. It asks me, what do you wanna use? Which tool? I'll use the brush. Get a very small brush. Again, my flow is set up high. So let's just click right there, holding down the shift key and just drag it across. So now look at, if I hover over the radial gradient, we see the overlay for that. If I hover over the brush, we see the overlay for that. So I'll get a little bit larger of a brush as well. And I'm on the brush and I'm subtracting, right? And I just wanna make sure that my gradient doesn't go beyond the window, okay? And I went quite a ways beyond it there. So I'll just hide that, right? So now if we look at the brush, that's what I painted. Might need that as well, okay? But what's cool about this is that I can change either one of them independently, right? So that brush stroke and that radial gradient are completely separate. So you can toggle between them by just clicking on them, right? Either in the mask panel or just on their little pins within the window. So if I have the radiant, look at, I can go ahead and move that spotlight around, but the mask on the window sill and around the window, or not the sill, but the divider is going to stay the same. All right, so multiple components can make a single mask. All right, let's get a little bit more complicated. I'm kind of tired of looking at this image. So let's go to the next one, unless there's a question. Uh, I, was, I was just gonna say, I'm so excited about these features personally, because I go back to Photoshop 2.5 um, and used to, te used to teach Photoshop, um, but I've you know, stopped using Photoshop quite a lot because Lightroom just keeps getting better and better and better. And for us, I've got a, a system called KISS, Keep It Simple Shooter. 
um, where Lightroom has just gone this big step further in regards to helping photographers be photographers and not knocking Photoshop. As you know, it's got a, a special role that it plays. Um, but for most photographers, this all is very exciting, Julianne, and you're demonstrating it beautifully. Well, thank you. I couldn't, and I couldn't agree with you more um, because I try to, even though I, I, I'm still one of those, those photographers that probably takes at least 50% of my images into Photoshop afterwards because I like to really clean up and I'm more kind of graphical usually in what I'm taking. So I don't want any extraneous information in my images. So I do go to, to or maybe I'm just not that good of a shooter and I need to use Photoshop. Either way, I still go to Photoshop a lot. Um, but the ability to take it as far as we can today is just quite amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So let's look at this one. Um, what do we want to do here? I'm not going to keep, you know, I'm not going to walk back through those, those, you know, well, here's the, it's, it's embarrassing. Here's the original, but you know, sometimes you're just at a place and it's in the middle of the day. I had to take three exposures. I put them together. So this is an HDR file. I made a bunch of global edits. Uh, that's not quite exactly where I want to be. So I'm going to undo both of those things. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah. Because this is where I want to start with this image. Okay. So um, I'm just going to do the masking aspect of it because by now I, I think that looks good overall. Um, the sky's a bit bright for me, but we'll go ahead and work on that in just a moment. So again, um, you know, if the mask wasn't showing and I knew what tool I wanted, um, oops, don't tap the L key, tap the K key next to it, that would give me my brush. So, um, Oh, in this case, I actually didn't want my brush. So that's okay. So I'll just undo that too. Sorry. So let's just grab, oh, oh no, no. Come back, come back. All right, deep breath. <gasps> okay, select the mask. Then I was gonna start with selecting the subject because this is kind of crazy. Now, this I told you earlier was artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So when I choose select subject, Lightroom is going to go out and try to select the subject. Now, it doesn't do a perfect job on this because I highly doubt that it has been trained on Joshua trees, right? It's, it's primarily trained on people and primary subjects. So when there's one subject that's clearly in focus and well-defined, like a different color, but it can also, it's amazing with people and stuff, if they've got a sweater that has different colors, it still knows that it's all the sweater. So it'll jump over color edges that in the past it, it was so difficult to select. So. Um, it's, it's selected the subject. So I'm going to go ahead and just warm it up a little bit. So I just, you know, I could move this over as much as I want, but do you see what's happening to the boulder? So it also selected the boulder. If I tap O again, we can see there's that red overlay. So not a problem. Okay. All I need to do, I've got select subject, and then I just need to subtract the area I don't want, right? So it's the boulder. Would it be helpful maybe if I leave the overlay on? and I choose subtract and I choose the brush. Now, I don't have to go and erase or anything, right? Like don't change the brush settings because I'm subtracting. So I'm gonna paint this area here that I don't want, that it thought was part of the subject, but it's like, no, no, no. So you can always override what it thinks is part of your select subject. All right, I'll tap O again. So now we can see like if I did something like temperature or tint, you can see it's making a change only to that area. Now, the other reason I wanted to show it to you on this image is because a lot of times you'll want to select everything else, right? You don't want the subject. You want everything but the subject. But this will happen to you, right? So I'm going to duplicate this. So this is the JT. That's my Joshua tree, right? Now I'm going to duplicate it. So this little more icon right here, the three dots, that is very important. You get a lot of options there. I'm going to duplicate this, and we'll just call it not <laughs> Joshua tree. Okay, but here's the thing. If I start making a change, like let's go the other direction, right? So I'm gonna cool down everything, but no matter what I do, do you notice that, um, let me look at this, not the Joshua tree. Yeah, okay. So it's actually working as, as hold on. I think about this for a minute. Oh, right, okay, <laughs> silly me. So because I've duplicated it and I'm making the changes to it, it's making the change to the Joshua tree and I need to invert it, right? So I'm gonna click on the three dots again, this more icon, and I'm going to invert the subject, okay? 
And you think, all right, so that's that's easy. We got that. So now when I make my change, we can see, well, let me go ahead and do it with the temperature again. We can see that it's changing, not the Joshua tree, but it's having this like, uh, what's it doing over here? This wasn't inverted. No, because you don't want it to be inverted. What you need is you need to change it from being a subtract from to an add to, right? So in the Joshua tree mask, we selected the subject and then I subtracted that area from it. Here, I need to do the opposite because I've selected the subject, selected invert. Now my brush, all I need to do is use the more icon next to it and convert it from a subtract to an add. And now when I make those changes, it will also change that boulder area. All right, so I'll just go a little cooler with this since we went a little bit warmer with the initial selection. Now, the sky, it's actually the color of the sky there, but it's killing me. Um, it's making my eyes bleed. It's so much saturation there. So let's go ahead and add a, a new um, select sky, right? So artificial intelligence. Now, in this case, in this instance, we could also go to HSL, right? Because it's really kind of the only blue thing in the image. So I could have just gone to HSL and decrease the saturation and decrease the luminosity, but I wanted to show you that it also does the sky. It, it, can, it can change or automatically select the sky and then you can make changes to it. And the great thing about that is that it does kind of a better job around the edges, especially when you're fading like in, in a tree line or if you've got a complex um, kind of horizon. All right, so in this case, all I wanna do is decrease the saturation. Oh, that's so much better. It's so much more deserty to me. And I might also, do I want to darken it? No, I actually think that's good. All right, we'll leave it like that. Okay, now the last thing I want to do is I want to add one more mask to the bottom. I want to take out kind of the, the color from the sand down here, but not from the rocks, not from the flower, not from the base of the tree, but I don't want to paint it, right? So I'm going to create another new mask. It's going to be a linear gradient. I'm going to go from maybe here to right about there right, at an angle, and then I'm going to decrease the saturation. But now I need to start subtracting some areas because all of the areas down here are being um, desaturated, right? So I'll click subtract. First thing I'll do is I'll use the brush. I'm going to decrease the flow, right? So I can slowly build up. I'm slowly building up the subtraction. So that way I won't get like this harsh line at the bottom of the tree, right? So I might paint once or twice there. I might come over here. I might come to the rock here and maybe just paint once to get a little bit of that color back. But here's the thing. When I go to this flower, like I don't want to have to paint each one of these individual flowers, right? So what we can do is we can say, well, we want to subtract that as well. So let's subtract, but let's use color range because they're all similar in color. They were all kind of this purple color. So I'll choose color range. Now, I can either click with the eyedropper, that'll select a sample color, and I can click up to five different times. I can click and drag to select a range of colors, which might be easier. So I'll just do that. I'll click and drag there. And you can see now we've got a lot of that red coming back in. And you can click and drag as many times as you want around the area, but isn't that much better than having to actually go in and paint each one of those? That would have been terrible. And you can also refine it, right? So here's the color range but we can either make it um, looser or tighter. If I hold down the option key as I drag this, you can actually see the mask that it's creating. So that can be helpful as well. All right, I'll hold down the space bar to just zoom back out. And gosh, I haven't talked about um, toggling the visibility of the masks. So you can do it for the entire mask, right? Or a mask component, or you can actually use the light switch at the upper left to toggle on and off all of the masks at once. Okay, so with that, um, with the color range though, I wanna show you one other example, just in case that wasn't obvious enough, because sometimes with color range, it, it took me a while to get my, to kind of wrap my head around it. And most people wanna use it in the way that they used to use it. So they're always asking me that. So let me just show, I'm just gonna run through it real quick one more time. I'm gonna grab my brush, all right? Because if you wanna use this the way it used to work, I don't want you to be confused. I'm gonna grab my brush and let's say I wanna change the yellow here of this sign, okay? But I don't wanna go in there and just like have to paint super carefully. And I, I don't wanna change the yellow in the rest of the image. So I'm just gonna paint, uh, let me bring up my flow all the way to hundred. I'm gonna paint in this area right here, 
All right, so I painted over it, but I've also painted over the red and everything. So if I were to change the hue, um, you can see a little bit of the grass is changing and the red sign is changing. That's not what I want. So I wanna limit it. Well, let's go ahead, we'll change it. We'll change it to, I don't know. That's nice, nice little blue there. So I've changed it, but I want to limit it to just the color of the sign. So I don't wanna add to it because it's already paint over. I don't want to subtract from it because that would take away the yellow. What I need is I need a way so that where there's brush, where I brushed with the, with the brush and where I select a color, the intersection of those two masks, that's what I want to change. So I only have the option of add and subtract, right? So no, you hold down the option key and that will change to intersect. So as soon as I say intersect, then when I choose my color range and I click and drag over the yellow, which I've shifted to blue, it'll say, okay, well, the intersection of this brush, which is this big blob, and the color range, which is just the yellow, is this mask, which is just going around there. Now, it might be easier. Let me just show you white on black. All right, let's show the overlay. So here's my blob with the brush. Here's my color range. Okay, so it selected yellow throughout the whole image, but I'm restricting it. I'm saying only where the blob and the yellow intersect, that's what you can change. All right, so that's what we get as our resulting mask. And of course, there's a little there I could go in and touch that up, but I just wanted to explain because it's, sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around um, intersecting two different components to make a single mask. All right, we'll put that back to red and do that. Um, we should definitely move on. There is luminosity masking as well. Um, if you ever wanna delete your mask, you can just click the more and delete all your masks. But luminosity works very much like color range, luminance range. Um, how would I do it? Well, I wouldn't have started with luminance range, sorry. So let me undo that. Instead, I would, let's delete all the masks and I would start with probably a linear gradient. Like what I wanna do right now is I wanna darken down the top of the sky, right? So if I grab my linear gradient and I drag this down, when I move my exposure to the left to darken it, the trees also get darker. And if I don't want those trees to get darker, well, lovely, they're a very different luminosity values from the original sky. So in this case, I just wanna subtract them, right? Because I'm affecting everything in my linear gradient but I need to subtract some of a luminance range. So I'll choose luminance range. And then you can either click again, just like with the color, you can shift click up to five points. You can click and drag over an area, or you can use this range area. You can scoot the range. So different areas are affected. You can elongate the range that's being affected. So now not only are there very dark values, but it's getting up into my midtones. Then between kind of this, there's the rectangle in the center, and then there's this other divider right here. The distance between those two, that's the fade range. So the further I move it over, the softer the fade will be. And of course, we can either hold down the option key or show our luminance map if we wanna see what is being masked and what is being affected. All right, so now as I move this, you know, really dramatically, obviously that looks kind of silly and I need to change the range, but we can see that the top is having a lot of an effect and those trees aren't being affected nearly as much. So check out the luminance range. The last one is the depth range. I'll just, I just wanna mention that before we edit these two other images. Um, the depth range, really that's limited right now to images that you're taking on your camera, on an iPhone to be more specific. And I don't know exactly which models they are, but you have to be in portrait mode and you have to be able to do it with the depth map, right? Because portrait mode will take it with the depth map. You can turn on the technology preview if you're photographing with the Lightroom camera. So in Lightroom, on mobile, in the camera. Again, I, I didn't know how many of you would be doing this. So I just wanna show you again on my blog, if you're interested in this, see, look, there's the luminance mask information. Here's the, the depth range masking. So it walks you right through that. And I think that's just on a post called, yeah, you can do, like V11, just search for that on the blog and you would find that. So if you want more information about that. Okay, but let's go to these three images because there were questions, right, Darren? And one of them was, can you retouch a bird image? 
Correct, correct. So we were very fortunate um, on the trips, which you unfortunately weren't there for, Julianne, but we're not <laughs> going to talk about that today. We'll, we'll move on. But we, uh, each trip, um, we had some lovely Australian birds um, to photograph. And, the, you know, birds are never easy to, to get. Um, and sometimes the lighting's not perfect. So this particular example with the rainbow beater, um, it's a lovely shot, lovely capture, but the sunlight wasn't fully on the bird. So just wondering how you would go about processing this image and giving a little bit of spark to the, the feathers and the bird in general. Okay, so first let's be clear, this is not my image, this is, this is your image. Correct, um, and I'm happy would... for you to go for it. <laughs> I, I probably, maybe I'm, maybe it was a good thing I wasn't there. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten this image. I love it. So let's go back to the original, right? So here's the, the full image, the raw image that you sent me. And I thought I would just walk through this because we, I don't know that you need to see all the sliders. I can point them out if you'd like, but the first thing would be the lens correction. So I would go down the lens correction and just apply the chromatic aberration and remove any of the distortion. Um, then I cropped in really tight. I don't know if you would have cropped in this tight or if you, yep. you know, the thing is today, there's so many, you know, like you need it on Instagram and you need it in one format and then you need it on, on you know, my banner. I don't know why on my blog, it's like this crazy 16 by seven aspect ratio and then you need it on video so it's nice to actually have a little bit of space so you can crop to different aspect ratios um, then i applied a different profile so um right here in the profile area you can see i've applied the adobe landscape as opposed to color nice thing about landscape as a profile is that it will take automatically within the profile it will remap all the values in your image and in the shadows and the highlights it's actually compressing those so that you get more information. So while it's compressing it, it that's people are like, oh, I don't want them compressed, but, but you kind of do. Like I, sh I should say it's like expanding them so that you see more information, but technically that's really not what it is. But that's what the landscape profile does. And it also, it adds a little saturation, a little bit of an S curve, so it can be beneficial. A lot of people wouldn't realize, I think, Julianne, too, that uh, in the background, um, the Lightroom team at Adobe actually do a lot of work that looks like one button, but in actual fact, it's not. So I was fortunate to um, work with uh, some of the team uh, came to Tasmania uh, with Lightroom 2. And I was fortunate, I was one of the photographers from all over the world to get involved with a, a one-week shoot. Um, it was beta field testing Lightroom 2 and um, to meet them and see their passion to help photographers uh, they listened to our, our questions our concerns and then acted which we're now seeing the benefit of all these little features which are so cool and as you would know some of them have got a lot more in the background than what we might realize oh absolutely it's always interesting when you when you know, and, and anyone, any customer, we love it to get um, feature requests from, from our customers because, you know, that, that helps us build a better product. But sometimes you ask for a feature and you, you think it's so easy. You're like, oh, that's going to be so easy to do. And, and that one's so difficult. And then you ask for something that you think is going to be just this horrible detailed thing. And they just like, oh no, they, they, can, they, they have these days where they go in and they, they fix things and they change things and they add things. This is like, it's, they're, that's an amazing team. It's really fun to work with them. Okay, so then uh, healing. I don't know if, if you allow this or not, but I would get rid of that little um, branch there. Yep. So I just did that in, in Lightroom. I mean, I think it's great. You can just take something off like that and heal. And then some tonality. So this is just right here, over here. Um, it, it's probably very close to auto. Should I click auto? Oh no, auto goes too far. Oof, we're gonna undo auto. But um, it adds a little bit of exposure, uh, increases the shadows, right? To bring up a little bit of information in the bird, um, brings up the whites a little bit, just to make sure that my dynamic range, if you look at the histogram, I wanna make sure that um, if the image warrants it, I'm taking advantage of everything from all the way from black to white. Um, and I didn't add any text. Oh no, I, I'm just not there yet, right? So after I go to tone, then I go to presence. So I'm adding a little bit of texture. 
a, a smidge of clarity. Again, uh, the difference there, the texture, if we zoom in, the texture is going to be added to the absolute highest frequency areas in your image. Whereas, and you can see, you can watch as I move it over to the left and right, like it's, it's, it's above sharpening. So you still, if you want to sharpen your image, use sharpening, but texture is going to add just a little bit of, it's going to add contrast around edges to the edges in your image that are a little bit larger than sharpening, but smaller than clarity, right? So if we come to clarity, now it's going to add it's going to find those edges, but when it adds that amount of contrast on either side of the edge, it's going to do it to a thicker radius. So it's not working on the finest details. It kind of goes up to the next area of edges or the next threshold of edges and adds that contrast. So I think that's a bit too much. So I'll just back off there, maybe back off on the texture as well. And then dehaze, um, I used it here just to set the black point. So I just scooted it over, watching the histogram until I see that it starts climbing up. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. All right. Um, okay, then after presence, uh, HSL, I just lightened, uh, I, I desaturated the, the blues a little bit in here. I could have done that with select sky. It's just um, depends on how you want to do it. And then just a little bit of masking and local corrections. And that's just, if we look at the difference between those two here, I just thought it would, it would help a little bit lead the, the viewer's eye up into the image if I just darken that down a little bit. I didn't want to add a vignette because it starts looking weird because the direction of light I didn't think worked with a straight vignette because I don't want the top darkened down. So instead, in fact, if we go to the mask, we can take a look at it. There's just two masks here. The first one is this linear gradient that's just darkening down the lower left. And the other one here is just lightening up these branches a little bit just so they weren't so dark because I, I found my eye was going there over and over again. And I just, they, they to me, like, I don't want people, I didn't want people looking at that. You want them looking at the bird. So um, I just lighten those up. So if we do a little uh, backslash key, there's before and there's after. Now I could go in, I don't really know um, what those birds look like. Boo hoo, because I've never seen one in person. <laughs> but you could go in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because you could definitely go in and um, and enhance it more, right? Like you could go in and, and bring out individual colors, the colors of the wing, the breast, but I don't I don't know how you guys feel about that. So I'm going to leave it alone at that. Yeah, no, that? No, that, that's great, Julian. It's, uh, I, again, as you've demonstrated there, so often subtlety is more important than dramatic changes, and unless, of course, you've got some artistic reason to do that. So, so Pierce, for example, he loves um more subdued blue skies he you know some of my skies tend to be a bit strong and all that and he always you know drop them back drop them back and just and a so, little bit just a little bit <laughs> yeah just a little so as you say it's an all, all an individual thing it's you know in the end we be it, creative, it is we? it really is and also it's it's how it's the emotion that you want to create in the image right and that's why I'm always very, I, I get a little weirded out editing someone else's image because one, I've never been there. And two, I don't know what the intent is necessarily. And I don't know, I don't want to push it too far and, and, you know, offend anyone. But I was kind of thinking like with this image too, you know, it's just amazing to me that a sky can even be like the color of this original, right? Like that just seems insane. But if you've got a polarizer on, you can get some really blue skies, but when I was there, it looked more like this. So I thought maybe, because if we do a little before and after of this image, that's before and that's after. And when I was starting to work with it, the sky got too saturated for me. So I, I decreased the saturation. In fact, let's walk through it again. So here's the original image. Um, and then I did the lens correction. I don't know if any of you will notice or not, but I actually did it backwards, but I, I just, then I was like, oh, I got to redo all this these other ones, these little snapshots. So I didn't, so it's, it's a little backwards if you notice there, but the point is you wanna remove the, the lens distortion. I applied the profile, oh, sounds very familiar, went and healed. So I am, this is what I mean when I, when I heal things, I'll go in and just like these little sticks here or here or here. Again, you know, I'm not a photojournalist, so I'm just trying to remove everything that's distracting. And I'd probably spend a little bit more time doing a little bit more, but um, also stuff that's in the water. I took out a lot of things probably in the foreground. If we go, yeah, see there, even the, the big um, piece of mud there and then just all those small little things. Cause I don't want someone thinking, 
oh, what is that? You know, I want them to look at the scene and not focus in on this little detail that isn't significant or adding to the, to the story I'm trying to tell. All right, then changing the white balance. I thought this is probably taken, it's sunrise or sunset. I don't know which one. So let's warm it up a little bit. Change the tone a little bit. So here I've really increased or decreased the, the highlights, increased the shadow. Again, I think it was a little bit too flat, but then when I add the presence to it, it's gonna give it a little bit more um, contrast, right? To the edges and everything. So I wanna be, um, be aware that that's going to happen. Is it straight? Now that I'm looking at it, I'm not sure it's straight. All right, I'll it's, just ignore that. Then that I went- central kind throws you out. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Then I think I went to HSL and I did something. Oh yeah, see again, I'm not sure because I don't know what color it was, but I did go in here just to the hue and I don't often do this, but I just took my oranges in one directions and the yellows in another direction because the, the yellows are actually a lot of this green, right? There's a lot of yellow in that green. And I just wanted to separate the, the, the living um, plants from the actual rock. So by splitting that and taking them into two directions, I thought maybe that would, you know, it would increase the contrast between them, the, the visual contrast and the color contrast. Then I had to lighten the clouds down here because I really, I, I wanted to bring them out. And then I added a little bit of a vignette. So this is starting with the masking, right? So here after HSL, this is all the global adjustments. And if we could do a little before and after, so those were the global adjustments. But I think what really makes the difference are these local adjustments. So bringing up, making the, the clouds a little bit lighter in the water, adding a little bit of the mask, the vignette, so around the edges there. Then I wasn't sure about this, but the sand looks a little pink to me, a little magenta. I, I don't, honestly, I have no idea what color it is. So maybe just warming it up a little bit. Oh, now actually it looks a little green to me, but that's all right. Um, darkening the sky. Yeah, I know. Like every time you come back, couldn't you like re-edit it a million yes. times, a yeah. million different ways? Totally. That's why I actually like, I love syncing things because I, I post all my social media from my phone most of the time. And so when I make my collections and then I sync them and then I'm looking on my phone, it's so nice to have Lightroom on my mobile device so I can make these little tweaks, especially because, you know, if you're posting to Instagram, your vignette's probably going to be much different than if you're posting or if you're printing the image. So it's nice to be able to make that little tweak and have it, you know, yep. carry along with the file. Yeah. Um, and then I desaturated the reflection a little bit because I did use with this darkening of the sky, you can see here that I actually used the sky select. So it's the sky, um, the uh, machine learning. So um, yeah, so then it's it, an incredible it, it, feature. It's very accurate. Yeah, it is, but it doesn't understand the reflection. Yes. Right. So yeah. then I had to go in there. And so I guess I could have done it again in HSL because there's nothing else really blue in this image, but I think yeah. sky select is doing a better job on edges. So um, yeah, I really like it. So those were, those were two where I was just sitting there going, oh, boo-hoo, I wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and on that point, we can announce that um, we're going to do our best for 2023. So May 2023, um, you've been invited again and you've said yes again. So fingers crossed and whatever yep. this little bug is that keeps going around at the moment, hopefully every, everything's sorted a bit better. I'm confident it will be. Yeah. So anyone listening to this, you know, if you've enjoyed what Julianne's been showing, um, I know if you go to her website and, you know, on her website and her, her blog in particular, um, the amount of diversity of um videos that she offers uh, and the feedback I, I always get is is that she talks in such a simple a down to earth manner and gets the information across and from our company's perspective that's what we love we don't like over, over technical um, feed, you know tips and all that sort of thing you don't need to do that do you Julianne you can really keep things simple you really can the the I always say like, it's, I mean, I started in the dark room and, and my partner and I, we, we always, he always says, it's just not fair. You know, like we, we both started in the dark room. It's just, it's just a slider now, but it can really, you know, that's the beauty of it is when you go somewhere and you experience something and it makes you feel a certain way. It used to be that you, you get back, you know, your, your prints or your roll of film and you'd kind of be like, oh, well, that's, that's not what I felt. That's not what I experienced. And yes. yeah. I think it's lovely that it, 
Lightroom Classic and Lightroom, either one, you know, as you move those sliders, you can really kind of bring back that feeling. And yeah. I don't know, because, you know, nothing's nothing. What is reality? I mean, like I said, I'm not a photojournalist and we experience things differently. And, you know, we'll, you were in that same location with probably other people and everyone took a different photograph. So why not be able to take artistic license with it? Just, you know, with, without all this like burden of curves and Photoshop in the olden days with adjustment layers. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, guess what? We were the only group there. Jeez. Oh, the only photographers, that's, just us. That's, yeah, it was, that's amazing. It was very, I, don't, I don't know if guys realize how special that was because the Kimberley uh, this year was so busy because Australians couldn't travel overseas. They traveled Australia. So everywhere, everywhere we went was just packed with people. But early, early mornings, we were the only ones. So it, was, it was a beautiful experience. I know you're going to get to do it in 23. Um, so look forward to that. I, I look forward to taking you to this exact spot. And hopefully we've got some water there. It, it changes each year. You never know. Um, Pierce, have you got a, a final question at all? Or, or do you have a quick question. finish on something at all? I, I don't know if we have enough time. Um, but I've had a whole lot of questions recently doing one-on-one -on -one workshops with with Lightroom is the color grading and like a workflow with color grading. And that might just be okay. too much time, but if we've got like a quick minute or two. Yep. I would, okay, sure. I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say five, but let's do it in one. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> because, <laughs> so the first thing I would do, cause I, I would do all my basic edits, right? So yeah. that's yeah. like, you know, you're in your basic panel and, and get your, uh, and I usually do this to a color image because I'm usually doing both. But mm -hmm. if you knew you were just going to black and white, you can just go to black and white. And so this actually has a treatment. It has a profile applied to it already, Artistic 3, but you know, these profiles can be changed at any time. So if you want, you can start with a black and white profile, all right? And if you click this little icon right here, that's your profile browser. There are a whole bunch of black and white profiles that kind of, they act as if you have put one of those filters on your camera, right? And change like we, like we used to do, but you don't have to. You don't have to start with any of these. Um, you can just start with Adobe Monochrome. That's a great place to start. Then make your adjustments to tone and presence. All right, and then if you were gonna go into color grading, there's kind of, there's three circles here, right? So you've got your shadows, you've got your midtones, and you've got your highlights. Now, let's do something really simple because this took over split tone. And I think people are pretty familiar with the kind of definition of split tone where you're adding one color, let's say in your shadows. And I'm gonna do this, it's gonna be really garish, sorry, but for the example, you just, I want you to be sure that you see it. So once you drag in any of these circles, and if you prefer more control, you can actually click on each one of these and you can actually click the little peekaboo things to go between them, but let's just do this where we can see all three circles at once. All right, so once you click in a circle, you can go ahead and click on the outer little dot there if all you wanna change is the hue, and you can click on the inner dot if you just wanna change the saturation, right? So I'm gonna leave it set up, and I'm going to add color, so blue in my shadows and blue in my highlight, I'm sorry, and yellow in my highlights, right? And I'm gonna leave it at this full saturation because I wanna show you the difference between the blending and the balance. So we'll start with balance. Balance is just gonna shift where the colors fall in the range. So if I move the balance over to the left, it's actually going to add a lot more of the shadows. If I move the balance over to the right, it's gonna add a lot more of the highlights. You don't need to memorize anything because all you need to do is move the slider over to see the difference, all right? Now, you might think that blending does the same, but it doesn't. What blending does is it determines how the two color ranges cross over. Okay, so I'm gonna put another, this is gonna look horrible, another color. Ah, look at that lovely green. Now, if I set the blending all the way to nothing, and let me go, let me just, oh, there you go. There we go, let's do magenta in the highlights, all right. Blending to the left, no blending. You've got three specific colors. You've got blue, you've got green, and you've got pink, right? When I move the blending over to the right, the crossover between those colors is getting blended. It's like you had the two colors 
And now you've put like a watercolor um, in between them and it's blended those colors. So we don't even see the green anymore with the blending all the way up because it's blended the blue with the green across to the magenta. All right, so those are the different, the balance shifts where the colors start and stop. So do they start and stop in your shadows, your midtones, or your highlights? And then the blending determines, okay, when you have two colors, how do you blend the edges of those colors when they cross over in your shadows, midtones, or highlights? All right, so please let me just double click to reset my, um, <laughs> yeah, my uh, midtones there. I actually, I very rarely um, add color to my highlight area, but I do, when I tone something, I will add some color to my shadows. It's usually really, really small. And it just depends on if you want it to be warmer or cooler, just after whatever look you're after. So if you wanted something that was a little more sepia, you might want to add a little bit of an um, orange here, and then maybe come up in your mid-tones and maybe just add a smidge. Ooh just a smidge of more of an orange to yellow. Again, I mean, it's personal choice. And then for this one, I would definitely go in with my mask and grab my brush because I want you to see the reflection here, right? So I would probably paint up here over that one area of trees and then come back down here, right? And then we could just take the exposure down a little bit and see how it kind of, like, <laughs> so it's so cheating. It just snaps it. So you're looking at that tree. Okay, I think I overdid it, but I think you get the point. Okay, but if I could have one more minute, there's one other way we could do this. You don't have to go to grayscale, right? It doesn't have to be a grayscale image that you're color grading. It can be a color image. So let's put the mask back. All right, and let's um, let's just go to uh, D for develop. That's That's a, why isn't the mask going back? What am I doing? I don't know. I'm just going to click on the mask for a second. Okay. So in basic here, instead of going uh, to monochrome, we could just leave this in color. And then you could use the saturation to take out most of the saturation, but I wouldn't, I would go to saturation here because now I can take out all this saturation, right? But I could say, you know, those orange trees were pretty cool. Well, that doesn't really go with the <laughs> the colors, but that's okay. Or you could say, you know, the luminosity, maybe you needed to change the luminosity of the orange. You wanted to make it brighter or darker, or maybe now you decide, you know what, these color grading, these colors just don't work. I wanna go the opposite direction. I wanna add a blue color in my shadows, or I wanna add maybe a, a tealish color there. I'm not sure that that's working for me, but you get the point is that you can, you can do this to a, a grayscale image or you can do it to a color image. And of course you can do it in combination with HSL and you can do it in combination with all of your masking. So you could paint over an area and then restrict your adjustments to just that area using like the intersection with the color range masking. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing what you can do, it blows your mind. I, I found there's like there's like this play between using the color wheels and using the HSL and really, you know, taking colors out and making, you know, saturating more colors and they yeah, really work well together. And it's always nice I think to it have really panels close by. <laughs> it really helps if you have intent. Right. So yeah. I didn't really have intent with this image. And you can kind uh -huh. of tell you're like, well, why would you do that? And I'd have to ask myself that right now as well. Like, <laughs> why would I do that? I'm not, I don't think I've added to this image, but just um, kind of off the cuff. The other thing is I didn't make a virtual copy, which I usually would mm -hmm. so that I'd still have my original and then I'd have my virtual copy so I could always go back to it. And there are so many presets too, which is something we didn't talk about. And I'll just end on this real quick because there, are, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm not going to use someone else's presets or I don't know, there's opinions on presets, but my opinion is what a great learning tool, right? Like we ship with all these presets now. So you could come down here and just go to cinematic and just move through them and see what they do because most presets aren't going to change the tone and presence area. Some of them do, but most of them don't. Most of them change your profile. They change the tone curve. They change HSL and they, ch they change color grading. So come down here and find one that you like, All right? Let's say it's, let's it's say a great, it's 13. Great starting point, isn't it, Julianne? Great yeah, right. And, and to explore, right? So you yep. could go in here and say, well, what did it do? And just these little toggle switches, 
say, oh, look, it's done something to the tone curve. What has it done? Oh, it's pulled down my whites. What has it done in HSL? Oh, look, it's changed green and aquas. I mean, you can then start, you know, if you see someone's work or you're, you apply a preset and you're like, wow, that's, I really like that. That's how you can start learning and kind of teaching yourself is by looking at other people, at other presets and what sliders they've used. And I'm not very good at like just rolling over, like that doesn't help me a lot. So I actually created these two templates and you guys can download them. They're on my, my blog. And I just used a color chart. So you could go in and study like what is FT and what is FT is probably futuristic, futuristic 10, you know, what does it do to the colors? So you can see that some of it like, oh, this is using color grading or curves probably to add some blue. And it's also changing the way all of these colors are mapped in your image. So you can download this. And the great thing is, is because I use smart object, you can replace the, the little color thing with your own image and the effects applied to all of your image. And I'll just, because I'm not sure I explained that very well, I'll just go to Chrome and just show you that, where is it? Ah, oh, I lost it. No, it's right here. Actually, it's that same one. If you do V11, if you just search on my blog for V11, here are the files. You can just download them right here. And here's the instructions it tells you. And then you can substitute your own image and then be like, hey, I like you know preset X, Y, and Z. And let's go look at what the curves are and what they did with HSL. And let's go figure out how I can do this myself to my own images. No, look, fantastic. Thank you, Julianne. The what we're going to do is add some of those links and that at the end of the video to make it easy for everyone. Um, and of course, everyone's got a, uh, this is a recording, so they'll be able to go back through it a couple of times and do whatever people do when they're watching these things. <laughs> but, but mainly learning. There's, uh, you know, I super appreciate your time. Um, I know your time is very valuable and you're a very busy person. Um, well, your absolutely. Tips, again, so, you know, they're so easy to understand. I learned a couple of points, absolutely, just what you went through there. I hope everyone else has as well. Thanks, Pierce, uh, for being involved. And Julianne, we're going to catch you in 2023. <laughs> I really hope so. Thank you so much. I, I should stop sharing. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. I would love would love I mean for years now I've wanted to go on one of your adventures so I really let's let's make it happen and make it happen yep. soon totally yeah. we'll say goodbye all, Catch right. You all right thank you okay bye-bye